an overlay on natural systems. The facilities of a city uh, the, and the activities, uh, water, energy, food, etc., should be geared toward the natural systems that the urban area has been overlaid upon. Uh, this will be done. Uh, it, it will be done from necessity. Right now, it sounds a little um, a fairy tale-ish that urban areas are in nature, but in fact, no development of the city in the future will be able to be done without accounting for these natural systems. There's got to be a balance where you where you look at using the city to actually create the things that people need to survive as well as using it to create a, a more flourishing democracy like people actually being involved in decision making and things that you know relate to what they what they need and then you know and then a connection between urban places to rural environments that do support us really strongly believe on the value of local agriculture and the culture of local agriculture. And I don't care whether it's organic or commercial, uh, it's really important for people to be connected to their food. It's very encouraging to see the food systems work that's come up, that's um, organic is so important, but it was never ever just organic that was going to solve, you know, the bigger picture. So that kind of food justice struggles that are there, alternative distribution systems, uh, an entire market and economy that's grown up around providing alternatives. Cities are never going to be food self-sufficient, right? We don't have enough land and space here um, to grow wheat for ourselves, much less pasture-raised goats. But what happens, again, by growing some of our food, not only do we, again, do we cultivate that ecological consciousness by getting people more uh, aware of their surroundings and our reliance on natural systems, but then we start to take the pressure off of the countryside. Like imagine if San Francisco produced 30% of its own fruits and vegetables. That then opens up space for the spinach growers and the strawberry growers to not just grow spinach and strawberries. If cities become more self-sufficient, and that doesn't mean 100% self-sufficient, but as cities become more self-sufficient, it just lessens the slack. We need to develop a suburban backyard farm movement, which is to say to take all of the lawns uh, in, in, that surround cities because, you know, you, you have a lot of roof gardens now growing food, but that can never begin to feed 2% of the people, you know. But there's a gigantic amount of basically unused land, land that is just growing grass, growing water consumptive grass. We really need to, to attack the whole fossil fuel problem. Um, the way we structure our energy use is inherently problematic um, and, and is, is becoming catastrophic. The problem with cities, it seems to me, is primarily the problem of cars. I mean, if you're in Copenhagen or Rome and uh, you see what a pedestrian area you know, can do in terms of the uh, quality of life in the city, you realize that this thing is really absurd. So the city you know, just has to deal with the car problem as the number one issue. If you've ever been in Manhattan when there's been a taxi strike, it can be marvelous because there's so many, you know, there's so few private cars and so many cabs, you know. Just the taxi strike in the city becomes, it becomes magical. So there's a growing interest in what's called low impact development, which says when you build something, you should try to, as much as possible, mimic the way water would naturally behave. It has tremendous benefits for clean water. It also happens to be more aesthetic. The more plants you use, the more you're sequestering carbon, which is something that we need to be doing. And it would have the effect of making our cities more generally permeable to wildlife. And in California, where we have water shortage issues, it's also how you recharge the groundwater. And my idea of of restoring a creek is doing as little as necessary to make it become natural and just let it happen. Picked up a copy of the Potrero View one day and saw on the front a picture of an egret flying over a freeway. And I had no, I didn't even know that the bird was called an egret, but I knew that it was something really neat that I sort of thought as being something that you went somewhere else to see. And to find out that it was in San Francisco really grabbed my imagination and my attention. 
And whenever you see in the paper that somebody saw a coyote in San Francisco, I jump up and yell, yay. It's, it's fascinating right now to see the um, coyotes coming back into the urban environment, um, seeing these megafauna, um, these different kinds of critters just popping back up. It's a wonderful thing because urban environments tend to bleach those things out because they're scary, they don't fit. And we're trying to figure out a better way to fit, and I think that's very exciting work. You know.